Good afternoon and welcome to the May 18th meeting of the board's strategic planning committee. We're really excited about the topics we have today. We are doing something a little bit different, delving into things a little bit more this year through our committee process. So we're going to have an ongoing discussion today about math. These conversations we're having are going to provide context and background information that will deepen our understanding about um, what's going on in our buildings. Today, we're going to continue on two topics. As I said, math is one, but the other is on disproportionality. And in fact, I think we're starting with disproportionality. As you will recall, we discussed this at our last strategic planning meeting, and we asked for some data to be brought back today. Um, last year, we started a discussion on math, and we talked about a paradigm shift in, in how we are doing our math pathways. So at a board meeting, our last board meeting, I believe we had a recent discussion on evidence of learning, which showed how our students were doing in math. Today, we will have an in-depth discussion about the vision and plan for a comprehensive K through 12 math program. Before I go on, I'd like to give my colleagues a chance to introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Kim. Good afternoon, Arvin Kim, student board member. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry I can't join you in person. And we're joined today by a number of uh, MCPS staff, starting with our chief of staff. Good afternoon, Lori Christina Webb, chief of staff to the board. Good afternoon, Carla Lopez Arias, supervisor of behavioral health. Good afternoon, everyone. Shauna K. Jornby, uh, director of student engagement, behavioral health, and academics. Good afternoon, Stephanie Sharon, Chief of Strategic Initiatives, and I know they're not at the table right now, but we have Dr. Keisha Logan, who will be presenting later, uh, Ms. Jennifer Loznak, uh, who will be also presenting, as well as Ms. Sheila Berlinger. Okay, thank you. So next I'd like to ask if there are any concerns about the February 21st meeting informational summary. Okay, great, then we will keep moving on. Ms. Sharon, you may begin. Thank you so much, Ms. Wolf. Can we bring up the slide deck, please? So as Ms. Wolf indicated, today we are going to be talking about both an update from last meeting on um, disproportionality and suspension at the conclusion of last meeting. Um, there was a request to come back and provide an update on the work that has been done. And then we're going to be doing a deep dive on the pre-K through 12 comprehensive math plan. Next slide, please. So as we know, um, in our strategic plan under pillar number two, which is well-being and family engagement, um, our one of our objectives outlined is to implement school level practices to support effective and efficient behavioral health management systems. So as I stated today, we're going to do a review of our data to date on disproportionality. We are going to give an update from the last meeting. And then lastly, uh, we're going to be showcasing a strategy highlight that we are moving forward with in order to address alternatives to suspension. Next slide. After that, we are going to move to our academic excellence pillar and focusing in on improving student achievement in literacy and math with a math focus. And this is going to be a really engaging conversation today where we're going to be talking about the vision moving forward um, of math and of the math plan and some of the shifts um, and talk about why those shifts occurred from saying at around Algebra 1 be, being by 8th grade to now saying that Algebra 1 can be completed in 7th, 8th or ninth grade. We're going to talk about some of the implications of that and what we're going to be doing to address that. Um, we're also going to be showcasing a data story of how we got to the point of where we're at today and then what we're going to do next. We're also going to touch on community engagement and how we're engaging with our community around these shifts. And then um, lastly, doing a deeper dive on the plan and then the next steps for the future as we think about how we want to ensure equitable outcomes for all of our students in mathematics. So next slide. Before I turn it over to uh, Ms. Jorindby and Ms. Lopez Aria, or Aria Lopez. No, I got it right the first time, right? Lopez Aria, thank you. <laughs> um, 
I do want to bring to the forefront of this conversation our evidence of equity questions. I ask that as we're listening to and engaging in dialogue um, for our strategic planning committee meeting today that we think about everything through these evidence of equity uh, questions, particularly who does this conversation or practice, decision, neglect, or marginalize, whose voices are dominating or being prioritized? What are the adverse impacts or unintended uh, consequences that could result from what we're discussing today? What steps are in place for data collection to measure our impact? And lastly, how diverse are the stakeholders leading the implementation? Those are our guiding questions, as you saw in the anti-racist audit presentation and in many presentations previous to that, that are really um, framing our work as a system. Um, so I ask that we think about these as we're engaging in dialogue today. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Ms. Jornby. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. So first of all, greetings to everyone. It really is a pleasure to come back to talk with you today. Um, I was not able to be with you at February 21st, but this is work that I'm very excited about, and very invested in, and so happy to be here. Um, we'll begin with a reminder of the importance of the urgency of our work. So MCPS, much like our counterparts across the state and the nation, has been challenged with disparities in exclusionary discipline. Uh, specifically, our African American students are often suspended twice as much or more as they are represented in school populations. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit because the last time we shared data with you, we shared data with you that included our black and brown students, that included our Hispanic Latina students. But I do think it's important today to highlight our numbers for African American students. Our Hispanic student uh, suspension data is close to proportionate. So they represent a little over 35% of our populations and account for about 37% of the suspensions. So population and uh, numbers are, are more in line when it comes to out-of-school suspension. So I want to look specifically today at our students who are African American or black. And this is an area that nationwide continues to be something that we have to work on um, as a society, as a system. These are our kids and our responsibility. I want to start with something personal. When I began as a teacher in 2005, 2006, our district suspended over 9,000 students that year. 55% of them were African American, only representing 19% of the population. Um, over time, with changes in policy, professional development, a focus on equity, school climate, school culture work, overall suspension numbers have decreased to less than 3,000 per year, last year being the lowest they've ever been at about 2,500. While this has been great work for on behalf of our students in keeping them learning, keeping them in school, keeping them engaged, connected to graduation rates, um, reducing to about one third as we were 20 years ago is significant. While we've made changes uh, that have impacted our African American students, they have not been as significant as they have been in other areas. So I'd like to take you back um, a little bit to 2016. And uh, this is pre-COVID. And so pre-COVID, our African-American population has remained stable. It's about 21% and some change. And that hasn't changed in years. That's our representative student population. Uh, what you see in the column in front is the percent of the total suspensions that are of African-American or black students. So in 2016, 52.1% of all suspensions in Montgomery County were of black children, only representing 21% of the population. You can see that there's been incremental changes throughout the years. And as we sit today, as of May 8th, this is real live data, the suspension rate for our African-American students for out-of-school suspensions and exclusions are 42.5%. So that's a 10% change in the last few years. Additionally, I think it's really important to note that for the first time in Montgomery County Public Schools history, uh, we are below what is a, a two times the population ratio. So typically, our African American students are suspended much higher than twice the number of their population. Uh, right now, our suspension rate at 42.5% is below that uh, 43 point 
6% that would make it two times the population. So that's actually a first for us as a county. And while we are not where we need to be by a long shot, I think it's worth stating that it's important that we continue to move this work in the right direction. Um, so again, while we've made some incremental gains in disproportionate suspensions as shown in the table, we've not yet been able to move the needle in a way that our students truly, truly deserve. Um, next slide, please. So here are the updates since February 21st when we last spoke with you about uh, disproportionate suspensions. And again, then we spoke about black and brown students. Um, one of the things that we wanted to report is just the update since then. So we met with all schools that were identified. We met with 15 focused schools for disproportionality. And uh, they met at a March 9th uh, meeting session work group. Uh, principals bought their staff development teachers, their RJ coaches, their different leaders in the building, their specialists were there, our directors, and they engaged in learning around implicit bias, learning around special education needs, uh, learning around um, data analysis, and a variety of topics. In that meeting, they were encouraged to create a specific focus plan using a guide in order to address disproportionality. And I've provided a sample of that with one particular school with you today, one of the action plans. Since then, we have met with those schools on their own space in their environment. We've gone out as teams, um, including uh, special education, who's been a big part of this work, to, to meet with schools to focus in on those plans. Since March, 10 of those 15 schools have lowered their year-on-year -year suspension for the month. So not on the year, but when looking at last March to this March, uh, the numbers are down for those schools. In April, looking at the same, 11 schools have lowered those numbers, looking at last April and this April specifically. Some other things that we're doing outside of the local school work and the trainings that are happening this summer um, include some technical aspects. So our um, suspension worksheets that principals fill out have codes on them for suspensions that are not suspendable. A good example of that is dress code. I believe we've had about 16 suspensions for dress code this year. It only goes up to a level two infraction. It is not suspendable for out of school. But we see that some of those things slip through the cracks. And so we're looking at how those are better monitored in real time. So we're working with not just um, OSC, but we're also working with the director side in terms of principal accountability. We know that there are laws that protect our suspensions in K through three that uh, make K through three suspensions have to be something that a psychologist and a director must sign off on unless it violates a federal law. Um, we don't have those same measures in place for middle and high school. And so one of the things that we're looking at is to how to better supervise those in terms of making sure that suspensions that are not allowable go through. And that means changing the suspension worksheet to not include them in the first place. That's a small one. Second one is in the updates to the code of conduct, those areas that are grayed out, instead of just being grayed out, they will say, this is not suspendable, <laughs> um, to just make it more clear. Um, we are working on trainings about the code of conduct and other factors over the summer, not just with principals, because they're not the only ones that make uh, exclusionary decisions, but also with the APs through their leadership development. Um, we are also working on one final point that's really important. Um, monthly reports for our principals. They have daily access to their own reports, but just because you have daily access doesn't mean that you look at it on a regular basis. And so not just at the local level, but at the central level, going through those monthly and seeing trends and patterns for support. We also know that the highest suspensions, for us at least, come at grades eight, nine, seven, six. And I think that's a conversation that we have to continue to talk about. We know that there has to be more support for the middle. We know that our kids at that age often uh, struggle with decision making, and there are other developmental factors that have to be 
a consideration. And so working with our leaders in the middle to elevate those and work on strategies that work is something that we're going to need to look at. Uh, the state recently re released their bullying report that showed the most uh, common ages in Maryland for bullying to happen. And again, they kind of mirror those suspension ages. They are 10, 11, 12, 13. And so that's grade 5, 6, 7, 8. So that those transitional the year before middle school, the year after school, and middle school itself, something that we as a system have to continue to think about. Suspensions are not just about what happens when kids come into our schools, but they start long before that. And they need to be something that we continue with in terms of support for our students. But more importantly, addressing our adults, right? Uh, making sure that they have those restorative mindsets. The last thing I wanted to share, last slide please is a strategy that is going through um, a focus group process. We already have alternatives to suspensions outlined in the Code of Conduct. There are many, many, many of them listed. Um, I think sometimes as a large system as we are, um, uh, sometimes it's either too much or too little. And so what we're trying to do is create a process where we can focus down to four core practices that are alternatives to suspensions. Right? They're already there, they've already existed, people do them, but we're making this universal so that we can ask those same questions. And these are only for lower level infractions. Priority is keeping our schools safe, so they're only for level three and four infractions. You're beginning in school and you're short term. They do not apply to higher level consequence. What the core four is are four strategies that are high leverage. So the first one is the parent shadow. Some of you might know this from years ago as the reverse suspension. It is when something happens and instead of the student being out, the parent comes in. So there was disrespect in the math class. A student used inappropriate language. Instead of suspending the student out, a parent would attend that math class with them the following day. And that triangulates the relationship between the parent, the teacher, and the student, right? Um, the second one is mini courses. We're looking at a couple of different companies that offer mini courses um, for different infractions, whether it's marijuana use, anger management, bullying, diversity training at the student level. These Courses tend to be two to four hours, and they're courses that you can take uh, virtually, and they have components in them that are learning components that students can learn or, or have consequences or intervention through learning. The last two are a learning project. I'm going to highlight Damascus High School, who does this very well. When something has happened, um, assigning students assignments where they can learn from it. So um, if a term is used that is not well understood or is harmful or hurtful, uh, one of the things that they can assign are essays based on researching that topic and a product that they have to produce around it to demonstrate their learning and reflection around it. And then the final one is service learning, right? And so that's giving back through service. Um, specifically related to the infraction. So those are what we're referring to as the core four. Um, again, they're not new, but that's us consolidating down the practices so we can say, with this student, have you tried the core four? Has this been attempted as a part of the restoration? Uh, one thing I do want to highlight about it is it's gone through some student focus groups already, and some of the feedback that we've received, this is not final, it may change, is um, we had uh, our high school students shared that they think a reflection component should still be a part of the core four. So no matter which one you do, that um, you should complete a reflection. It's gone through a few principles, and one of the feedback pieces is that um, um, they want to know if they're assigned or do students have a choice in which of the core four. So working through things like that is where we are. We're taking it through all the stakeholder groups, including parents, before we come back to you with something finalized. But these are some of the things that we have on the table. Okay, I want to thank you for that presentation. And you covered the last point, what's going to be my first question. Did you consult with the parents about how they feel about this? So you haven't gotten to that point yet, or you do have some parental input? No, we have it scheduled. We've been talking with different parent groups, and they've given us an audience, and we're walking it through. 
Um, so we want to make sure that we go through all the different types of stakeholders before we finalize anything, because we know that this is important to our community. And again, this is already in our policy. It's already in the code of conduct. It's reducing it down from maybe 20 strategies to saying these four are very high leverage. It's giving us some similar language to talk through when we're coaching and working with principals and school leaders. The reason I ask is I could see there being some pushback from the parents about having to come in because some people just don't have that ability. They might lose their job if they don't show up for work that day. And I, I don't know whether you've considered that and offering them any alternatives, but I think it's something that you need to consider. Everybody just can't stop what they're doing and come in the next day. We did, which is why we wanted to have four options. But we also think it's important to acknowledge that you know, we hear some similar talking points from our teachers sometimes. Parents care deeply about their children. And while not everybody will be able to, to do a shadow, for a lot of parents, it's a welcome opportunity to be in that room. They have strategies when it comes to relationships with their child that they could impart on the teacher or with the teacher. And it really does create a bond of that um, we all care together. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, we do hear, oh, this kid is out all the time. Their parent doesn't care. They're not invested. And I think it's a really bold way to say, not only am I invested, I'm here, right? And I think that that's not an option for everybody. But for some, I think it will help to strengthen the relationships. I think it'll work for some. I don't think it'll work for all, because a lot of the parents don't feel welcome in the school. Mm -hmm. So they already feel like you're mistreating their child, and now you want to bring them in to mistreat them, too. That's that's what I'm, I'm being very honest here. That's what they're going to say. So I think that that's something that you need to consider, that they don't feel a part of the community. And a lot of times, a child may not feel a part of the community. It might be why they, while, why they are acting out. But I want to talk a little bit about, there were 17 schools originally, right, that we were going to go back and sort of focus on. And you talked about 10 of them lowering numbers. What's going on with the other seven? Uh, there were 18 schools originally, I believe, okay, that we I'm sorry. talked about. That's okay. Uh, when we took a look at their numbers and uh, whittled them down to specific disproportionality, it's about 15 schools that are focused on. The other three we're working on on an individual basis. They're not a part of the structured action plan. And, and there have been results there already. Um, in terms of the schools that have just implemented their action plans, um, there's some that are further along than others. So some are already seeing results, like the 10 and the 11 in April, and others are still coming along. So we're working with all those schools. We meet with them on a regular basis um, to be able to get them moving. And so I, we see 10 have made a change in March, 11 in April. We're hoping that we see a continuation of that change as time goes by. Okay. I, I appreciate that the numbers are going down, but they're dismal still. Yeah, I, I mean, the fact that it's one third less than in, what, 2005, 2005 you that That is really not, not that great a number because we still have kids that are being removed from the class that are missing instruction. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that you talked about training, but you know this has been my big issue. You've been trying to change hearts and minds forever. They've been trained every year since I've been here, and it's not making a difference. What is it about this training that you think is going to make a difference? So we're focused on leadership. And I would say that you know, when we're looking at any kind of change management, right, we're looking at changes over time. They're not going to happen all at once. And so I, I do think 10% change in the last few years is really significant. And for me, going from 9,000 overall to 2,400, I think that's really significant. We are leading the state in that. There is no one that comes close. Uh, the next closest is, is Howard County with 2.3. Um, we're at 1.6. Um, in spite of that, I think we have to always keep this work urgent. I don't think, I can honestly say this is my belief, that the need for that training is ever going to go away. As we have new teachers on board, that philosophy is of, of, of knowing that our kids are ours and our responsibility and that kids are still learning and they have to be restored and they have to be connected. I think that's a fight we're having even now, Miss Wolf, if I'm being honest with you. Um, there are 
there are forces that want to work against that. But we've seen the change in that. I think 9,000 kids missing school versus 2,400 is significant. And we, we want to continue. One thing I will say to your question specifically is there's been a deeper focus on the leadership accountability. So we are working now a little bit more closer with our school directors in OSSWB to make sure that this information doesn't just go down to principals, but that their supervisors are also part of the conversation. Another thing that might change this, that might make this a little different, these all connect to our anti-racist audit in domain one and in domain five, in particularly domain 1.3 and 1.4 around student discipline that our constituents, that our, our stakeholders, that our community feel that black children are disproportionately disciplined is absolutely true. And now that's being written in, not just in our strategic plan, but in our local school improvement plan. So in the school improvement plan for next year, other than the academic goals of math and literacy, every school is required to have a school culture and climate goal, and also a student well-being goal. The metrics for those goals include chronic absenteeism, disproportionate suspensions, they include uh, uh, social worker services, they include many different metrics that schools now have to look at in addition to the math and the literacy as a part of the SIP goal. And so it makes us all a little bit more accountable for it. It's great to have the cat cat categories but you got to have accountability if it's not happening. And that's what I don't ever hear, the accountability if those goals aren't being met. I'm going to give um, my, my fellow board members an opportunity to, to talk. Thank you. Um, I had one question about slide five, just the, the, the changes and the variability year to year. Is there anything that you could point to for any of those as kind of a, a causal factor? Would you just say that that just kind of demonstrates the macro trend? No, I think there are some things. Uh, you can see um, trends. If, if you go way back, uh, there are a few that are impacted by law. Right? So if I'm thinking all the way back to 0506, um, there are laws that changed about K-2 to suspensions that became very important in uh, reducing suspensions for our earliest learners. I actually believe it's pre-K to 2. In Montgomery County, we do pre-K to 3. Um, and so I think that's a part of it, because our elementary schools do have the lowest suspension rates. Uh, there are key stages where different pilots were implemented. Like there is a different focus on social emotional learning that was ramping up in 16, 17 before the pandemic. Um, there were laws that were being passed at the same time. So uh, trauma-informed uh, uh, discipline and um, restorative approaches became something that was mandated at the state level. And that trickled down to the, the, the districts as well. You can see similar changes across some of the other LEAs. Um, restorative approaches became a requirement uh, for all LEAs July 1st, 2019, right? And so the impact of some of those uh, equity initiatives, the impact of some of those culture and climate initiatives, and the impact of policy have had a triangulated effect on making some of those steady changes. Again, not huge like the, the overall suspensions, right? Not two thirds down, but still incremental change. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and then I had a couple of questions about uh, those core four. The first I'd be uh, kind of curious to hear about, you know, what factors uh, maybe led these four to, be, to have the honor of being chosen as the core four out of, I know you mentioned that there was a, a, a greater list. Yeah, so that's really a great question, and I'm glad you asked it. There are some other um, factors that are, for example, a written apology. Um, they include other actions uh, that people might not as find as accountable. Right? So we wanted to tie these four to action, to something had to happen that was actionable and not necessarily visible, right? Uh, because student discipline is private, but it had to have a higher level of accountability. Right, so it couldn't be that just I, I wrote I'm sorry and that's it. Um, there's a list of them that have higher and lower specs. These were, were the most um, 
actionable of the four. We also looked at other school districts too, if I'm gonna be frank with you, and some of the practices that our colleagues uh, use as high leverage. And then we talked to some of our school leaders about what they do. Like I said, that third, that learning project, something that Damascus High School does fairly well. We have access to the local school RJ coaches who are able to share with us high leverage strategies. We actually have an inventory bank that we can look at to see what some of the schools are doing. And these are the four that really stood out as um, high leverage. Again, our students uh, believe that adding a reflection to each of those uh, without it being a separate thing would be a good idea, and I, I agree with them, um, is something that they would add. But these four are pretty well received. Thank you. Yep. Um, and they're just kind of my initial reactions looking at these four. Um, for me, the, the shadowing one in specific, I, I think um, what you described as triangulating a relationship between the student, the family, and the, the teacher, I, I think there's a, an immense value in that. But my concern would be kind of, you know, if, if uh, having the parent present in the room, how that, that, that might, you know, create some kind of perception with, with other students in the classroom, might other that student and, and um, maybe cause more, more problems. So, that, I mean, that would be my kind of initial hearing that reaction. Um, and then just the concern for the, the both the mini, consors, mini courses and the learning project, um, you know, compared to conventional in-school suspension, which is grounded in like a time frame as opposed to an assignment, um, the, the difference there just, just being short to, to be able to, to minimize effectively, you know, have those high level leverage points, but, but minimizing the, the time that the students pulled out of class. So the goal of um, an alternative to suspension is to keep students learning as much as possible, right. to keep them connected and in the environment. So it's one of the reasons we wanted the courses not to be, they have eight hour options, but we wanted to make sure that we selected two hour options or four hour options depending on the infraction. The topic varies in terms of how long it is. Um, a lot of time in in-school suspension, students are there. They're there, they have their AirPods on, they're, they're not connected to that learning, and we wanted to make sure that whatever action we gave minimized the missing from the classroom aspect. We're gonna talk about math in a second, and I think there's an important connection there to our kids being available to quality first instruction um, and to quality content. So uh, we took a look at that. Those mini courses don't necessarily have to be done during the school day. They could be done after school, they could be done before school, et cetera. It's one of the things that we're looking at to minimize the impact in being removed from the classroom environment. Great, thank you. Yep. Ms. Harris. Thank you. Um, just a, a couple of um, questions. So just for basic background and clarification, uh, Ms. Duranby, you mentioned earlier um, in the very beginning that these core four are available for, I think you said, I, I may get this wrong, level three and level four incidents, but not for um, higher level infractions. Can you just um, give examples of those things, you know, the lower level infraction? Yes. That, absolutely. So a level three infraction, the highest consequence in a level three infraction is an in-school suspension. It's a day of in-school. So the other things within that category include apology, detention, things like that. So within that category, if you were to assign the highest level of consequence, which is in-school suspension for a day, then this could take the place of that. So rather than the in-school suspension, the shadow, the learning project, the service learning, um, or the, I'm missing one, mini courses. Um, level three infraction looks like what we just talked about in February 21st. So all of those out of school suspensions that were given for disrespect, disrespect only goes up to a level three infraction. What that might look like is um, using inappropriate language uh, with a teacher or within the classroom. Disrespect might look like um, some forms of insubordination, but they only ever go up to a three. Um, level four looks a little bit different. Uh, level four category may include disruption. Again, those are two of the subjective categories that we've talked about in the past. Uh, disruption can look different uh, school to school. I can share with, one, with you one specifically um, from uh, the incident dashboard. A student was upset at um, one of their grades being said out loud 
and uh, there's a plant in the teacher's classroom, and they knocked over the plant, caused a disruption, they slammed the door, disrupted the class, it's listed as disruption. And so disruption is eligible for up to a short-term suspension, which is one to three days. Those are practices that could take the place of that. It, none of these practices are being offered at all for any type of level five infraction. Um, so th that's off the table. Um, but for your lower level infractions, these are things that could be applied, level three and possibly level four. Thank you. Yep. And just wondering, so we've been talked a little bit about contextualizing and comparing data, you know, from year to year and time period to time period. And I'm I'm just wondering, to me, um, it, it's very interesting and I think important to contextualize um, how we're handling issues, uh, you know, behavioral issues in schools with the time that we're in. Because you know, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic are, are are very different times when it comes to student behaviors. Because I think you know, every single one of our schools has a lot of students in it that are, are you know they are emotionally dysregulated. I was going to say that their development disrupted, and so we are we all know we are seeing more behaviors because students' emotional immaturity is is disconnected to their physical size and chronological age. So we are seeing more behaviors because the fifth graders are acting like, you know, third graders and the 10th and graders are acting like seventh graders. And how are we contextualizing what we're seeing in our schools and comparing that to prior times when it's kind of apples and oranges? Yeah, you're hundred percent right. I was going to say the same word that you did: emotional dysregulation, right? More elopements, more students um, expressing out uh, those feelings in a way that we might consider inappropriate. Um, we're seeing that, and I think that we're not doing the best job that we could in terms of teaching our parents about that. We're getting often more calls for the student kick the door or the locker. They should be put out of school, and that's from other parents within the classroom or with the community. And we're seeing it at a, at, a, at a grander level than that. One thing I will say is the supports of the social workers this year has been invaluable. We talk about where we are now, and I think about that, but I also think about where we could be. Like, what if these things weren't in place? What would that look like? Um, we know that we have uh, them at the high schools and supported by clusters um, for the other areas. I will say we just adding, we're adding five more. We're converting some staffing from vacancies, not within social work, but within other uh, areas, uh, and converting that staffing to be able to hire five more social workers, specifically for the middle. I mentioned the middle earlier. Um, we are also working with our um, schools on their restorative approaches. So we just did an evaluation that showed where each school is by standard and looking at those things for schools to say, here's a strand that's weak or here's a strand that's strong and providing the appropriate support. The, the word that you just said, development and emotional regulation, has to continue to be a part of the conversations. And and I think it is to the credit of our county, to the credit of those who've supported the budget, the social emotional um, supports that have been put in place in the last two years are revolutionary. There are counties that are still going up and so instead of going down. And so I'm really proud of that work in terms of that there's even movement. So I think we have to make it a priority to continue those services. And Ms. Harris, to be honest with you, that's where a little bit of my fear in is we can do the trainings, we can do the technical, change the forms, we can put in stopgap measures in place, we can work on the restorative environment, we can work on our communication and partnerships with parents. But those measures of support that include the humans that support well-being, I think are gonna be equally important. And I think it's a conversation you're gonna hear me say throughout the rest of this year, because they, they are on our, our ESSER budget and we have to think about how beyond this time to keep the work going. Thank you for adding that piece of context. And I do appreciate you as well um, acknowledging up front, because I think we've all seen it, that there are, well, primarily parents out there 
um, who we've seen respond to some of the incidents in school related to this sort of dysregulated, you know, emotional maturity um, with calls for harsh and judgmental discipline. And, and to me, that's utterly inappropriate and it's not definitely not going to fix the problem and it's not going to help the behavior. So I appreciate the system being very direct in acknowledging um, those factors. Um, and I did have a question too. Um, you'd mentioned the focus groups that you're currently working with and I appreciate that you don't want to really, um, and I really do appreciate the way this, this school system has evolved from internally creating pro, you know, you know, products and then putting them out for public um, acceptance instead of working alongside the communities that we serve to develop the products, which so I think we're in a much better place with that. And you mentioned fo focus groups of students and students commenting that they thought whichever, if, if we're looking at a, an incident in a school and a student disciplinary incident issue and um, a core four strategy is going to be utilized, the student saying that whichever one is chosen, that sort of this um, accountability piece needs to be built in. Now, are you, did you, are middle school students included in this focus group? Yes. Yes, they are. Um, high school has been the one vocal about the reflections. Um, from middle school students, we've had questions about SSL hours connected to the back two. So we'll, we'll be doing a memo um, when we get all the final results to be able to share with the board before we, we proceed with anything further. But this is just what is being considered. If you've ever heard anyone say, they're talking about that core four thing, this, these are the conversations we're having. And there have been changes already. And we're going to continue to make some of those changes as we get through each of those groups. And I'm wondering, too, I'm assuming teachers are part of the focus group. Yes, we're going to make sure that teachers are part of it, too. Because I know, I think, I, I'm, I know I've heard, and I'm assuming all my colleagues have heard, um, a lot of teachers speaking about um, their experiences over, you know, last year and this year. Uh, being dramatically different from their experiences prior to the pandemic when it mm -hmm. comes to um, the way they are treated by students. And um, among the things that they talk about just experiencing in, in, you know, never before at never before levels are, you know, students being directly disrespectful to them, calling them names, and then students just getting up, walking out of class, walking yep. in and out of class, just randomly wandering the halls during class. And so, wondering if what the how the um, what the teachers' input are into when those are the issues you're trying to address using these core four strategies, because we're saying that the one of the purposes of the core four strategies is for students not to miss class. But when the basis of their disciplinary issue is the fact that they're not going to class. How are those two things sort of being integrated? So I think about the alternative, right? The alternative is to suspension. And I've always found it kind of, um, I'm trying to think about how to say this correctly. So if the consequence for class skipping or truancy is to suspension, kind of doesn't make sense because you already don't want to be in school. You're already out of class. So the consequence can't be that you're out of class more. So um, I think these, they're not going to be 100%. 80% of our strategies that are universal, I'm sorry, our strategies that are universal will only work for about 80% of folks. I even think about um, restorative strategies when it comes to recidivism. Uh, when, we, when it comes to attack on a student, it's effective um, for... 83% of students. It's not effective for 17% of students. When it comes to fighting, effective for 82% of students, not effective for 100% of students. When it comes to disrespect, according to our data this year, effective for 70% of students, not necessarily 30% of students. So there will always be students that need more. There is no part of me that believes that this is going to be a strategy that works for every child. I wish it was. I hope it was. I would work towards it being so, but it's not going to be a strategy that works for every child. There's always Always going to be higher levels of intervention that are necessary. And I, get, I think my last question goes to the involvement of, of parents and community in your focus groups. Um, because one of the things I've heard, and I will be 100% honest with you, this was purely anecdotal. Mm -hmm. I'm 
hearing uh, from parents talking to the the ripple effects of MCPS disciplinary policies into the community. And they were saying things that the level of information you as a parent have about a disciplinary issue in a school that involved two, you know, that involves student on students. So, uh, for example, a bullying in, in incident. That the that the knowledge and the awareness that that the parents have differs, whether you're the parent of the student who was bullied, or you were the parent of the student who was the bully. And one of the things they were saying, and again, purely anecdotal, is that if the, the parents of the student who was the bully, bullier, um, received less information and may not even know. They often don't. Who And so that has ripple effects in the community. If you're thinking about maybe this incident between two students, the families socialize or live near one another. Mm -hmm are in a common, you know, social circle or common activities. And the, the parent of the student who was bullied is wondering why the parents of the bullier aren't acknowledging the behavior, you know, reaching out to see how, how the bullied student is doing, if there's anything they can do, making some sort of an apology. Yeah, so, and so how is that you, playing out in your focus? You kind of hit the nail on the head. So two things. The first one is, that's a challenge because student discipline is private. There are many times as a principal that I've been in a room with a, with a parent and I have wanted to say, hey, listen, this is what happened. These are the measures that were taken. This is how this student was held accountable, right? But we're not allowed to do that because like grades, like anything else, th that, that has a level of privacy. What you described in the second session about parents going to each other, Making that apology, I saw this happen just yesterday at a parent bring their child to the bus stop to apologize to another student and another set of families for something that had happened. Um, we are encouraging that every day and sometimes having a hard time getting through. That's a restorative approach in itself. Right? That means parents coming together is important. Right? Not just the, the consequence that's given, not just the restorative approach that the school gives, but parents together saying that these are our children and we care to come together about it. We work on that every day, and I gotta tell you, it's one of the hardest things to happen because it's not just students that are experiencing trauma or needs with regulation or, or anger or upset. Our parents are too. Um, and so that's a difficult part because we can't force it. We can't make parent A and parent B come together. We try, we get, we get a lot of flag for it, but it's an important component, which is why we've got to engage our community in this work, because I think we're at a standstill until we can get our families behind us. Listen, I want to thank you. Um, Ms. Harris, I don't know if you have anything else, but I really need to move on to the math portion. Um, and we are going to bring this back because this is an unfinished discussion. Um, you raised some of the issues that I was going to bring back at the end, so thank you for that. Um, Ms. Sharon? Thank you both. At this time, I'm going to call up uh, Dr. Keisha Logan, who's our director in um, OSIP. And we have Sheila Berlinger, who is our elementary uh, math supervisor, and Jennifer Lasnack, who is our secondary math supervisor, all in OSIP. I just need to put everything down. <laughs> You're starting, right, Keisha? Yep. All right, Dr. Logan will begin. Hello everyone, good afternoon, happy to be here today. Um, and we're really excited to be here to talk about mathematics. Um, we are hoping to engage in a dialogue today about the district's vision for equity of access in mathematics, um, courses as well as effective instruction to meet the needs of all students, and how our comprehensive pre-K through 12 mathematics plan um, lays a pathway out to be able to do that in support of equitable teaching and learning. So last year, our secondary math supervisor, Carl Seward, came to this committee and shared a strategic shift 
in our messaging, focusing on building students' mathematical thinking skills and conceptual understanding starting in elementary school with the intention that we build that strong foundation so that enrollment in Algebra One is then driven by student readiness and that that can occur in seventh, eighth, or ninth grade. And we're gonna talk more about this shift in messaging and how we've been communicating and how we're building in supports in the comprehensive plan to continue to build uh, understanding while also building capacity of our teachers to be able to provide that strong foundational support starting uh, as soon as our students come to us in elementary school. Um, in addition for today, um, we're going to be talking about our plan, um, know the math, know the students, what does that mean, um, what are the components of the plan, and how are we going to have those accountability structures in place throughout the, the year and, and moving forward to be able to really see the progress in the student learning outcomes. Next slide, please. So in MCPS, our goal is for all of our students to graduate prepared to enter the next phase of their lives. We're preparing our students for college, career, and all of our students to be productive citizens in the community. And we recently um, outlined our pathways to college, career, and community that highlights the academic milestones, the competencies, the learning experiences aligned to and in support of the, the blueprint for Maryland's future. And so the ultimate goal, which is one of our pathways to success is for students to be successful in Algebra 2 by grade 11 with a deeper critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, and collaboration skills. Those are some of the competencies highlighted in the pathways. And that the trajectory for this vision begins in elementary school. At the beginning of today's meeting, Ms. Sharon reviewed the evidence of equity questions, and I want to frame our discussion today by just highlighting two of those questions once more. Specifically, who does this conversation, these practices, and behaviors neglect or marginalize? And what adverse impacts or unintended consequences could result from our decisions and practices? This is what's guiding our work. This is what uh, is, is underlined in the plan that we're gonna share with you today. Domain six, equity of access, the anti-racist system audit states very clearly that students of color are underrepresented in rigorous and advanced courses and that our families of color feel these courses are not accessible to them due to district-wide policies on tracking, teacher bias and recommendation processes from school to school. And so our, our pre-K-12 math plan outlines an answer to the question, so what are we doing about it? How are we addressing that? And that's what we want to discuss with you today. Uh, so know the math, know the students. This is a jumping off point. Increased access and improved student outcomes also depends on the distribution of central support. So it's not just about building the capacity of our teachers, but it's us who are supporting the schools and ensuring that we're doing that in a way that is collaborative, that uses data, and, and where the teachers and the leaders have what they actually need to help our students to be successful. It takes all of us. We have provided for you a copy of the book Choosing to See, a Framework for Equity in Math Classrooms by Pamela Sita and Kendall Brown. We've been studying this text for the past couple of years with our math leaders. There's a quote that I want to elevate with you uh, today. If students are constantly asked to blindly follow procedures they do not understand, they will eventually come to believe that mathematics is not supposed to make sense. Our math curriculum is designed to build math thinkers and problem solvers so that math makes sense. And when we build a strong math foundation for our students, we build opportunities for access as they progress through middle and high school. Next slide. Thank you. So again, want to revisit the key message from uh, the presentation that we did last spring. Um, last year, we communicated a shift in messaging that emphasized the importance of student readiness as an indicator of future math success in Algebra 1. The key takeaway from, from that meeting was to establish that Algebra 1 readiness can occur at different points in a student's maturation. Students are best served by Algebra 1 when they demonstrate the prerequisite math um, understanding, skills, and readiness, and this can happen in, in grades 7, 8, or 9. Last year, we talked a lot about uh, the negative st stigma 
that is associated in our district with students taking algebra in grade nine. And, and that, that is real and that does exist in our district. And as we have been um, communicating this message throughout this year, this was a point of conversation, particularly as we talked to our math leaders and our principals about how do we begin to overcome that um, as a district. And it really comes with us um, in our practices and our actions and, and how we, the messages that we are sending at the school level to each of our students and to our, our families as well. Um, and also what the data tells us. So the data, enrolling a student in algebra um, is one thing, but the data was showing us that students were not grasping, and it still shows us, frankly, and we're gonna talk, we're, share some data with you today. Students are not grasping the modeling and reasoning skills necessary for success when they're in that classroom. And so what we want to do is start earlier with looking at building the foundation and ensuring that students are ready when they get to middle school and high school to open up those doors for them. Communication of this shift in messaging is critical, continues to be critical. So on the screen, I've talked about that we've engaged our math leaders and our school-based leaders. Um, our math plan for the upcoming school year calls for continued engagement, specifically um, at the last board meeting, you know, we talked, we heard the board engaging in discussion about engaging those those families and community members who are whose voices aren't typically represented, and so that's a big focus for us. Um, really looking to see receive feedback and dialogue um, with various stakeholder groups, including our students, um, about this plan and about this key message and about what it means for their own child and and how they are progressing in learning math. Next slide, please. And so to move us throughout the rest of the discussion, we're going to focus on one question. How are schools prepared to support equitable access and outcomes for all students with particular emphasis on students who are African American or black, Hispanic or Latino, receiving special education services, or emo emergent multilingual learners? This question has many layers from context to performance to planning and instruction. What we know is that equitable teaching and learning is instruction that is effectively differentiated to meet student needs while holding all students to the same high standard. In developing the comprehensive plan that we're gonna to share today, we focused on two areas. And in order to help with that development, it started with the data. We actually, school leaders are in a professional learning uh, training right now, and we've been working with them all year, our principals and our leaders on um, when approaching data, really using the data and looking at multiple me uh, measures to create a story. And with that data story, begin to really dig in when you look at how students are doing for our different uh, racial groups and for our service groups, to get to the root causes of why. We also model that and we do, we've done the same thing and we do it constantly. And so we're gonna share some of our data story to really to lay some uh, foundational understanding of how we've developed this plan. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer Loznak to be able to do that. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, I'm Jennifer Losnick, Supervisor for Secondary Math, and this is the beginning of our data story. So as we start this story, I want to ask you, where do you see yourself and your family members in these data? I see myself and my children reflected in the lowest yellow line on the graph to the left, where only 6% of Hispanic and Latino students were proficient on the 2022 Algebra 1 MCAP. When I see these data, it's professionally and personally something that I want to change. As a community member, I'd ask what needs to change so that not only my children, but the black and African American students at 8% proficiency and the students receiving services at 3 to 7% proficiency can be successful. I also wonder what is causing the decline for our white students in their, profi in their proficiency. These data tell me that we cannot continue the practices and policies that have led us here. So as we continue with our story for today, I ask you to keep an open mind with the possibilities that lay before us. This change isn't gonna be easy, it's gonna be a little messy, but it's necessary for our students to disrupt the trends and the causes of these data. Many of these students are sitting in MCPS classrooms right now as we speak here today. 
<clears throat> we can change the math education for them so that they are college, career, and community ready because Algebra 1 isn't the end game for our students. It's a benchmark that we measure math success for students along the journey. For example, success in Algebra 2 is called out in both the MCPS Pathways to College and Career and Community Readiness, as well as the Maryland Blueprint. Ultimately, it's our duty to engage students in learning math so that when they leave MCPS, they're prepared to choose their own path. So as I present the data and the response from the pre-K-12 math team, please think, what change are you willing to invest in for the future of our students, particularly our black and African American students, our Hispanic, Latino, students with disability, emergent multilingual students, and students receiving farms. Next slide, please. The previous slide is our, was our call to action and how students were performing. But before we jump into where are we going with this information, I want to take a look at how students performed. That's the graph on the left. And also, what is the test comprised of? And so we'll talk about the subclaims on the right side. So as we look at the data on the left, we see the red section where 30% of our students are beginning learners. That's the lowest level that you would test for. And then level two students are developing students, learners, at 49%. Level three and four combined for 21% of proficiency. In order for the students to move from the red to the yellow, the yellow to the green, and the green to the blue, we really have to elevate instruction in the subclaims to the left. Um, luckily for us, this can be achieved when our Eureka Math and Illustrative Math curricula are taught with integrity. All three of these components are naturally embedded within our curriculum. Let's talk about what this means. So major content is the critical things that students need to know and be able to do. And so if we think maybe back when you were taking math, you got a worksheet and there were 20 problems at the top that you had to solve and the two little word problems at the bottom that there was never enough room to write all your thinking. <laughs> um, that, it, the top por portion of that with the problems would be your major content. And 21% of our students were proficient in the major content. The reasoning piece of things is um, students being able to think critically about is this right, is this wrong, where might the mistake be, being able to justify their thinking. 24% of our students were proficient in that area. And modeling and application, 24%. So can you apply what you have been learning? So what does this mean? Um, let's make meaning of it. If the major content was the priority of learning, what that would look like in the real world would be, hey, here's an equation. Solve this equation before you go through a red light. That's just not realistic. That's not how math works. How math really works is that there's an issue, there's a problem, there's too much traffic. And so that would be the beginning of modeling, deciding that there's a problem. In the next part of the thing, we're going to um, decide what are the factors that impact traffic. And so we're going to reason through what's going on. How many people are on the road? What's the speed limit of the road? How many people make left turns? How long does the turning lane need to be? That's the reasoning piece of things. And then you're going to pull in what you've learned from the major contact, content and formulate calculations and decide, here's all the things I know. Here's equations for these factors. And then ultimately, you're going to decide, well, do my answers make sense? And so you're going to go back through that reasoning and thinking, I had a problem, I made some calculations, and do my calculations make sense back? And so that's the real world of mathematics. It's not just about calculations. It's reasoning and applying your knowledge. And so I just want to make sure that as we move forward, that all three of these subclaims are essential for students to be successful in mathematics and successful mathematicians in the future. The key message that I want to leave you here in this slide is that the balance of the major content, reasoning and modeling, application are necessary to be college, career, and community ready. When teachers know the math by studying the Maryland College and Career Standards and the curriculum, their instruction will naturally embed all three of these components. Next slide, please. The data story started with performance, and I elevated that the outcomes are not yet equitable across racial, ethnic, and service groups. And then we examined what the test means. Let's look at enrollment. Here's a snapshot at the semester of students enrolled in Algebra 1 
by grade level. I noticed a stark difference in enrollment for Hispanic students and Latino, Hispanic and Latino students in Algebra 1. With the examination of data, of, I learned more about what's going on for these Latino and Hispanic students. I discovered that currently there are 11,217 Hispanic Latino students in grades 9 and 10. 2,881 of them are enrolled in Algebra 1. That's a percentage of 26.7% of grade 9 and 10 Hispanic students. The course that they're enrolled in is Algebra 1. So I wanted to know what's the trend of this. The trend is that it fluctuates between 20 and 28% since 2018. I was curious about our other racial groups. For black and African American students, it ranges from 17 to 22 percent, while white and Asian students only range from 4 to 10 percent of their grade 9 and 10 students being enrolled in Algebra 1. The trend for students receiving services is similar to African American and black students, as well as Hispanic and Latino. This is a disproportionality that we are working to explore because the performance data tells us that they are not being any more successful in high school. When we examine things and when we've been working with schools, what we notice at both the elementary and the secondary level by visiting classrooms is that more support and learning for teacher needs to happen around releasing control in the classroom. They, that means that we want students grappling with the math. We want the students being the ones who are doing the math, doing the thinking, and doing the talking. This is essential for students to be able to build their own independence in learning and really say, I'm not just following an algorithm, but I understand, and when I'm giving some, given something new, I can grapple and come to a solution on my own. We'll elevate this idea a little later in our plan. Next slide, please. Before we move from the quantitative data, we want to just take a minute to define a couple of key terms that we often hear talked about within this conversation. We believe that words matter and that it's important for us to all be using the same language when we, use, when we talk about these three things. So first of all, rigor. Um, we use the definition from Student Achievement Partners in Common Core Shift. Um, it's a balance of conceptual understanding, procedural skills and knowledge, procedural skills and fluency, and application of math instruction. So what that means is that I have my procedural knowledge and skills, which are the 20 math problems that we might have done at the beginning of our homework. And then we have the conceptual understanding is, do I understand the steps and why I'm taking the steps to follow, um, to solve an answer? I'm not just blindly following an algorithm. And then the application is those, those word problems. Um, it's essential for all of these. Rigor is the foundational to our, to both curricula, both at secondary level and at the middle, at the elementary level. And so when we follow the curriculum, we are going to have, students are going to have access to rigor. Enrichment. This is taken from MCPS's own policy, um, policy IOA from the Gifted and Talented Education. And so enrichment is giving students opportunity to learn in greater depth and breadth. If the student is enrolled in an enriched course, then they may have additional cross-disciplinary projects or the opportunity to, to, to dig further into a concept. A student can also be on grade level and receiving enrichment. For example, this teacher in fourth grade may give a problem that says 846 divided by 2. Now write, an, write a prob word problem for that. So there's one answer for that. A student could say, a teacher could decide that a few students are ready for enrichment and they're doing well. They're still in the on grade level course and need enrichment. So sh the teacher could give a similar problem, the same standard, but it's going to say create a word problem that has an unknown number of groups and has an unknown number of amount in the groups. So this problem here is going to have multiple solutions. And so that's how we can enrich curriculum and understanding and teaching while students are still in an on grade level course. Acceleration. Um, acceleration is when we ask, when we have students skip or com compact courses. And so giving students a curriculum that is at a higher level than the regular curriculum, the information is more complex, 
or, infor or more information is covered. The material is presented more rapidly than in a typical, in than typical instruction, and students are confronted by a greater challenge than is customary with on grade level material. At the, middle, at the elementary level, we have compacted math 4-5, Five, six. At the secondary level, we have what's called AMP 6 plus and AMP 7 plus, which is combining grades, grade levels 6, 7, and 8 into two years. These courses that are accelerated are not always enriched. They are still rigorous. For example, at AMP 6, 7, and plus, at AMP 6 plus and AMP 7 plus, they combine three years of mathematics into two, but they are still using the same lessons and same activities as if a student was in math six, seven, and eight. And since they're still using the same lessons and activities, the opportunity to enrich is still there for all the students. Compacting is, does not equate always to that that's an enriched course. So what I want you to take away with you and keep in mind as we continue this discussed discussion is that these words aren't synonyms. Sometimes mistakenly, people use them interchangeably. For example, a student doesn't have to be in an enriched or accelerated to experience rigor. Rigor is about the combination of three things. For example, if you talk to any Math 8 teacher, they'll tell you that the curriculum is very rigorous. You can be in any course within MCPS and be engaging in rigorous instruction. Also, lastly, acceleration sometimes impacts rigor. We can, we, when we compact courses in order to accelerate students beyond the grade level standards, as identified by Maryland's College and Career Readiness, students often miss out in rigor. I don't mean making equations longer or numbers bigger. I mean balancing procedural knowledge and skills with conceptual understanding and application. The conceptual understanding and application make it possible for students to reason and model by using, utilizing the procedural knowledge that they have. As we circle back to last year's key message, Algebra 1 should be taken when students demonstrate the prerequisite mathematical understandings, skills, and readiness. When we skip modeling and reason to accelerate and compact learning to meet a graduation benchmark of Algebra 1 by a grade level, we are sometimes doing more harm than good to students' lifelong learning as mathematicians. Next slide, please. Hi, I'm Sheila Berlinger. I'm the elementary supervisor for mathematics. And so as you have seen so far, we've been having some um, ongoing challenges with success with Algebra 1. And it's important to acknowledge that there are instructional aspects to that. And there are also, um, there are also situations that have been occurring around schools along with what's been going on in schools. So a more comprehensive root cause analysis into the Algebra 1 data has surfaced circumstances along with the challenges within the classroom. So as you can see on the screen, as early as 2018, MCPS was really looking at how to continue to improve our success with Algebra 1. At that point, as per policy, curriculum was overdue for evaluation, so Johns Hopkins was contracted to evaluate our written, taught, and learned curriculum from kindergarten through grade eight, both in math and in ELA. Um, and it was determined that while our homegrown products were once seen in a very positive light um, and they were novel and assumed to meet the instructional needs of students with the shift to the Maryland College and Career Ready standards, over time it was found that better products were produced commercially. So Montgomery County followed the recommendations to replace its math curricula in all elementary and middle schools. And from there, an additional series of events followed suit, as you can see on the slide. While it's a big enough hurdle to change the tools themselves that teachers are using, and MCPS has been fully committed to successfully meeting the demand, um, we were excited to say that we purchased all of the products and all of the professional learning the vendors have available to ensure a smooth transition and the greatest success possible for the students. But in the middle of that multi-year rollout, a worldwide pandemic interrupted education for everybody. The, se the sequence of these events isn't shared to place blame, but rather to paint the longer term landscape that has culminated in interrupted successful learning for students. And our current middle school students have really felt the brunt of it. To Jennifer's point, they're still sitting in our classrooms even this afternoon as we're having this conversation today. 
One other key aspect of how the data present is the fact that MSDE changed the statewide assessment. As you all know, PARC was sunsetted and MCAP has been rolled out. And as a matter of protocol with any new assessment, students initially just have to sit for it and complete it. They are not held to a level of proficiency until the test has been field tested and standard set. We're in the middle of that right now with the Algebra 1 MCAP. Students still just have to take it as a graduation requirement. They don't have to pass it yet. And they know it. So one key question we ask is whether they aren't passing because they can't do the math, or they aren't passing because they know they, know they don't have to, or a combination of factors. We, we have not distilled between the two at this point. So our schools, teachers, and students have been managing significant impact and change over the last few years. Next slide, please. Do we want to take a couple minutes? All right, why don't we stop here? We shared a lot of data, gave you some historical um, benchmarks along the way, some milestones, and, um, and, and let's, uh, why don't you, so we can talk a little bit about what you've heard and what questions you might have so far, and then we'll get into the plan. Okay. Um, since you start, since you ended in your elementary math, can you talk a little bit about compacted math and what we're doing around that, where it's at? Because we get a lot of people saying, uh, we actually hear from a lot of the students that it goes too fast. They don't get the concept. And yet we hear from a lot of parents, we want to maintain it. So I'm glad you raised that question. And in the spring of 2020, in, the, in full disclosure, um, there are students who, who need to engage with mathematics and mathematics learning at different times throughout their maturation. It's the same response as there is about Algebra 1. And it does go very quickly. And it does compress a lot of learning, reducing those opportunities for application and reasoning. Um, in the spring of 2020, when we were caught in the pandemic and we had reduced instructional time, we rolled out uh, a process in partnership with Dr. Keisha Addison's office in the Office of Shared Accountability to begin identifying the profile of the student who's most in need of that accelerated learning um, for Math 4.5 and Math 5.6 so that we could best recommend who might be in need of that course. And then um, we provide that information to the schools. The schools then look at their students to see if there are any additional students that should be, that should be included in the courses. Um, we're getting re the first group of students that we centrally surfaced are moving into grade seven this coming fall, and will be fa most of them will be facing algebra one this fall. And so I've actually asked for um, an evaluation, a study of whether or not our identification process is effective. Um, the course does move very quickly. It was built internally and um, likely needs improvement. And we know there's a lot of pressure to keep that to keep those two courses in place, even though they're not likely uh, providing the opportunities for the students to engage in that rigorous thinking and the modeling and reasoning that they need in addition to the procedural learning. Yes, it does move too fast. There's no there's no time to fill foundational skills. Okay. So those those students have to be ready for that math. Okay, we we often talk about algebra one, but we don't talk very much about compacted math. So I'd like to get some statistics on that. Sure. Some demographic breakdown and and I'm sure it's probably available at every school. I don't know if we have kids in it at every school. So can I get that kind of information? I, I don't have to get it today, mm -hmm. but if you could send mm -hmm. it to me, that would be very helpful. Yes. But I have to say, I listened to you and I've, and I've talked to Ms. Sharon some about this before, but I want to be sure that our public understands what we're talking about here, because this is a little bit on the technical side. It is. What exactly is the paradigm shift? Can you just be put it in just plain English as to what the shift is. I'm not sure that that's coming through. That we're aiming for pre-K to 12 in mathematics? Mm -hmm. That we need to slow down and go deeper and make sure our students deeply understand the mathematics at every single grade level when they get to the courses, when they go from course to course. And so, but what, is that, what does that mean? What does that translate into, into course um, levels? So... Yeah, the, exactly. So Algebra 1, and Algebra 1 is the one we focus on a lot because that's mm -hmm. the course that the state has an assessment for that students have to pass to graduate 
from high school, or they have to sit mm -hmm. for right now, and they have to pass the pass the course. Algebra one in the Maryland College and Career Ready Standards is a grade nine course. Mm -hmm. In Montgomery County Schools, we have historically emphasized trying to succeed with Algebra one in grade eight, which um, Ms. Lasnak was referencing before that sometimes. In spite of the data, we were trying to get too many children to a course that was already a year accelerated. If you're taking Algebra 1 in grade 8, you are accelerated by one year, and somewhere between kindergarten and grade 8, you have to compact, compress, or skip learning. Mm -hmm. So to synthesize for our millions of viewers today. Yes, we have a, we're the most popular most show. Most popular show on, on television Absolutely. is that historically, as a parent, I have I, parents have been told that in order for your child to be college ready, college and career ready, you need to take algebra by eighth grade. That has been what, what, what has been communicated. That has been a belief that we have shared. And what we're saying is now, when you looked at the data, when we look at the research, when we look at the, at the blueprint, what best serves kids is to take algebra when they're ready. So if a child takes algebra in ninth grade, they're still considered ready for college and career. It's, it's not this, it has to be done by eighth grade. Some might take it in seventh grade. It's about readiness. Ninth graders will be just as successful in college as eighth graders. And I understood that, but I didn't think it was coming through in the presentation. Can you also, I, I don't want this to result in segregation. How are you going to ensure that that doesn't happen? Because, you know, typically when things change, it's the, the black and brown children who end up on the bottom and the other children are still on the, the track. So can you talk about how you're going to ensure that, that this doesn't happen? Because I think you're going to find that a number of parents are going to believe you're trying to... to keep their kids from getting the same opportunity as other kids. And that's exactly what we don't want to happen. Um, and as part of this plan, it starts with the data. It starts with the work that we're doing with our, our school leaders. And so that's why we've talked a lot about going back to elementary school, mm -hmm. right? And building the capacity of our teachers to meet the needs of all kids We've placed a lot of emphasis on Algebra 1, which looks at middle school and then leading into ninth grade, but we, it starts right when they come to us in kindergarten. So starting there, using the data, working with our schools to ensure that all of our students have the access to the, the, the instruction that they need so that by the time they get to middle school, the opportunities are there for them. And we've built into our, our progression of courses on ramps and off ramps. So within the courses, teachers would be able to, once the, the students get to middle school, really use that data once again to determine where students are and give them the instruction that they need so that they are ready. It starts in elementary school. Uh, thank you. I'm going to ask my fellow board members if they have any questions. Lynn, do you have any? Um, yeah, uh, just a couple. Um, and first I want to say I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this shift. In, in emphasis, messaging, and approach um, to we want students to access the Algebra 1 curriculum when they're ready for it, not according to some artificial construct. Um, because I know uh, when my son was going through middle school, he was one of those that that um, got pushed into algebra at in the seventh grade. And I, I knew it was not going to work out from the beginning, but I, I never got a good understanding of why, especially then when we tell students and oh, by the way, you got to keep going because you have to take a, 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 a math class every year you're in high school. And, you know, if they're in algebra in the seventh grade, they take geometry in the eighth grade, algebra two as a freshman, and they're not really a math person. And we're still forcing them into math classes that that just didn't work out for a lot of students. And it caused a lot of stress and anxiety. Um, and so this approach, I think, is first of all, it just makes more sense and um, is and secondly, I think we're going to have many, many more students that actually master the content and succeed and therefore have a much better experience of math. Um, and I also really appreciated you saying we really want to shift from being a school system that produces generations of students who just say, I'm not a math person and math doesn't make sense because actually the, the opposite is true, right? Math explains everything. And making sure that we're creating generations of 
of students who actually understand conceptually the math that we that we put in front of them and that we that we require them to go through with a level of both critical thinking and um, content mastery that allows them to apply those concepts. I mean, that's where we need to go. And I, I so appreciate that this is really where we're, we're focusing right now instead of on some sort of cosmetic approach. Look how many kids in our system are taking math when they're in the seventh grade. Um, and then this also gets to, I, you know, getting around that longstanding stigma that there was something wrong with being on grade level because I did never understand that either. I mean, your grade level, the grade that you're ready for. So what's wrong with being on grade level in the content that you take? And so the work that we do to really make all of our courses enriching and engaging and well taught um, is, is the most important thing. If we want students to have a good experience of education to, and to therefore become lifelong learners and, and to uh, master the content and succeed when they leave us. Um, and I did have a question that it gets to, so um, Ms. Wolf was asking about the compacted math. And I'm looking at, you know, the, the one of the populations that really, really concerns me is our, our um, EML students or emo emerging multilingual learners, because we've seen for over a decade now a disconnect between students that were you know, non-primary English speakers, whatever level their their English language mastery was, performing less well in their math content than their native English speaking peers, even when the teachers were saying in the classroom, they do just as well or better. But it was something about the way we were assessing them. And so what are we doing now to ensure that that it's the, the, a language barrier is not the what is is causing students performance on on assessments to be mismatched to their actual classroom performance and level of content knowledge. Uh, Ms. Harris, I really appreciate all of those comments and the question that you just asked. Um, the curriculum teams work closely with our partners in Delmi, and particularly at the elementary level, the elementary math team has been working with that English language development teams since the rollout of Eureka Math back in 2018. We've had a variety of tools that we've been developing and experiences that we've been providing to school-based math leaders, to ESOL teachers, to instructional specialists on both of our teams, and to classroom teachers. Um, even so much as developing the guidance for how to prepare to teach Eureka Math expects the teachers to engage in conversation at the planning table about both the content demand and the language demands of the curriculum so that as they're planning for the lessons that they're going to execute, they're pulling out the tools that Eureka Math has um, has integrated into it, or they're using resources that are coming from the ELD instructional specialist or the elementary math instructional specialist. Um, and while our, our teams are small, they're mighty, and we're, we're working to get to as many schools as we can with these tools, but that's just one example of, um, that's one example of where we've begun to integrate the two. The expectation together first out of the gate was, um, what is the content demand that the students have to achieve in the lesson, and what is the language demand? So they ha the teachers have to be asking themselves that um, up front, whether they're the general education teacher or the ELD teacher. Do you want to add to that? So at the secondary level, the curriculum comes with math language routines, and so it gives teachers, you're doing this lesson, here is a routine or an activity that you can do with your students so that your students are building language. And the primary reason for this was to engage our emerg emergent multilingual students. And so those are naturally embedded within many of the activities and on a daily basis with every lesson. And so we're working to expand those routines across the other math courses up into high school. And so in our April meeting with our math content specialists and resource teachers, we talked about this very thing of how, what strategies are we using to support our emergent multilingual students because we know we have to do more. And so what we are leaning on is the math language routines within the curriculum. Yeah, thank you. And I guess my, my question very directly, um, you know, our EML students, these are the students that we have, have 
chronically served least well um, for a very long time. And we are, are the outcomes for our, our EML students, our newcomer students, um, we are behind many other jurisdictions um, around the country in, in our outcomes. So are we committing to changing the old rigid pedagogy that said, this is the way we teach our EML students and they ha you know, we're not gonna let them, for instance, take a math or an algebra exam in a language it, with which they are most comfortable and then they can truly show what they know because that's not the way we teach. That's not the pedagogy. Are we really gonna move away from that rigidity, rigidity and really look to a, a method that allows students to show their true content mastery in whatever language that can work? At the elementary level, we have already begun to move in that direction. Um, because our belief is that we need to assess the mathematics learning, not their ability to read or engage with the particular language. While we don't have the assessment tools in every language that all of our emerging multilingual learners may need, we do have some of them, um, and we definitely have all of our materials in both English and Spanish. And so those are available as schools and students and teachers are using them. Thank you, because I really do think that's the way to go to, I mean, that's what, you know, really successful systems serving these students are doing. And I think because there's a, an emotional part to learning, right? And when you feel like you're constantly failing, um, you know, no, no wonder we have a hard time getting these students to um, stay in school and to attend regularly. I mean, there are other challenges, uh, absolutely, but but one is, what does it feel like to be in that classroom every day? And how, what does it feel like when your level of work and effort is not really rewarded with the mentoring with your actual understanding? So to me, the, anything that we can do to, to get rid of that rigidity um, is going to, because the, the first question always needs to be, what's best for these students? Um, and how can we best serve their needs? So anyway, I really appreciate this. Thank you very much. I have a couple of other questions, but I want to let you finish getting through your presentation first. OK, if we could go back to the slides, please. So we're going to pick up with the MCPS, next slide, please, theory of action and the, the three components. And you heard these three components in reference to the pathways that have recently been rolled out and also in relation to the anti-racist system action plan. So the question remains, how do these become concrete in the math classroom? How do we actualize this? What are the bridges that need building? What are the resources that need providing? And then um, it, that way we can impact student outcomes. So the vision of the pre-K-12 comprehensive math plan is that all students must become mathematical thinkers. They must become mathematical thinkers and they have to achieve success with rigorous on grade level mathematics. The pre-K-12 math team centers its vision around knowing the math, what students have to know and how they're gonna demonstrate it, and knowing the students, who they are and what their needs are. So this is accomplished when we all work together. First, central and school-based administrators hold schools accountable for curriculum implementation of grade level mathematics with integrity. That's a partnership between us and our school-based administrators. School-based math leaders lead effective math programs that meet the needs of all their stakeholders, be it the middle school math RT or the elementary math leader, they're supporting their teachers. And finally, classroom teachers securely study the curriculum and the ongoing data collection of their students. And finally, that results in all students actively engaging with mathematics instruction daily. Actively engaging is the key there. So let me give you some concrete examples of how leveraging the MCPS theory of action works towards achieving the vision. First, when we're talking about differentiating resources and support, we're talking about varying the levels of intensity of school-based coaching to match the school's needs based on their growth and the needs of the student service groups within the school. So it's not one size fits all. In addition, it includes conducting data analysis discussions to inform instruction and improve outcomes for all students, particularly emergent multilingual learners and students receiving special education services. 
Building staff capacity will also do at least two things. First, provide consistent and cross-office professional learning, coaching, and feedback to leaders and teachers. We're all in this together. It's not just one office or one team um, working on their own. And second, we can build staff capacity by co-planning directly with teachers to help them deeply study the curriculum and standards. And finally, we need to implement accountability structures. We do that when we conduct cross-office classroom visits to identify patterns in teacher practice to inform professional learning needs, as well as specifically conducting math classroom visits to all middle schools, which has been underway this semester. The Pre-K-12 Mathematics Comprehensive Plan has those two major focus areas that will ensure impact on student learning. When teachers deeply know the math, and when they deeply know their students and what they need, um, they will be successful in achieving those outcomes. The focus areas will require strong instructional leadership, equitable teaching and learning, and a deep understanding of mathematics pedagogy. They each play their own role, and they also play integrated roles in effectively knowing the math and knowing the students. Next slide, please. I'm gonna talk to you first about knowing the math and then knowing the students. Next slide. Thanks. When adults deeply know the standards they're expected to teach and the degree to which students are expected to demonstrate the learning, they know the math. Equitable outcomes demand that students experience learning at the grade level standard. And since strong instructional leadership is responsible for effective implementation of the curriculum and assessment, it's our support and that of school administrators that guides teachers to make sure planning starts with discussion of the standard. When math specialists work with school teams or school math leaders lead planning, the first step is always um, examining the upcoming critical standards along with the assessments that show how the students are going to demonstrate their learning. This is the priority work of the math teams. And let me give you a quick snapshot of elementary efforts around this. As of the start of May, so the beginning of this month, in elementary, we've had 126 unique occurrences of direct support and coaching just for elementary curriculum study and grade level planning on the ground in schools with grade level teams. That's with just three specialists and me. Adding coaches and or more specialists will increase both the schools who can receive support and the frequency or duration of the amount of time that we can provide that ongoing support. At both the elementary and secondary levels, Schools that study the curriculum and know the depth of the standard perform better on the district assessments. Examining district assessment data for impact at schools engaging in ongoing support is already underway, and it's a key vehicle to identify where growth is occurring. So we're in the middle of looking at all of that data. A second action is doing the math by doing the problems that the kids will see. When you do that, you clarify the understanding of exactly what the students have to know and show. Once the adults actively discuss the standards and the degree to which the students have to demonstrate, they can then make some decisions about how to approach the instruction in the classroom. You have to match those two things first. You have to know the extent to which you're teaching it. As a teacher, when I'm clear about the math to be taught and assessed, I can plan learning so that students will do that hard work that Jennifer was talking about. They'll be the ones thinking, speaking, writing. And that's what we want to have happen. So what does it mean to know the math? It means talking about and clarifying what the students need to know and how they're going to demonstrate it. Knowing the math is the what. Next slide, please. The other half is knowing the students. The anti-biased, anti-racist classroom is a space where teachers know and understand the math stories of their students. Math trauma is a thing, and Ms. Harris was just talking about what happens when we accelerate too soon or um, put students in a situation where the math stops making sense. All of a sudden, they begin to talk about themselves as not being math people. We need to put a stop to that. We're all math people. Instructional leadership is responsible for setting up the conditions so that teachers can collaborate and share instructional strategies to meet the needs of their students, including the special educator and the ELD teachers. This needs to be an environment where there's collaboration across disciplines. And the leaders will also provide timely and effective feedback. Both the elementary and the middle school curricular products also have tools that allow teachers to get some readiness data ahead of each modular unit. This is critical. 
the, both tools inform the teacher about scaffolds or supports a student will need ahead of upcoming grade level learning. When you're in an accelerated or compacted course, teachers don't have time to stop and work in that foundational learning. When you are in an on grade level course, there are opportunities for integrating that learning much more seamlessly and shoring up those gaps that students may have in their past learnings. The middle school tools are integrated into the materials and the elementary tool, Equip, which you've heard me talk about before, is an online tool and, and it has data that MCPS can access centrally. Equip has been rolled out over the past year and a half and with support and training for math leaders, the math team is working with teams and teachers to maximize its benefits. As of the beginning of May, um, as of the beginning of May, um, we have had a 600% uh, I'm sorry, from the start of this school year until the end of marking period three, we had an increase of over 600% in the usage of the EQUIP pre-module diagnostics. There is a pre-module diagnostic all, for all modules, grades one through five, to give teachers the information about whether or not the students have the foundational learning from the previous grade level in order to access the grade level content, along with the resources that they need in order to integrate it so students can access that grade level learning daily. So not only have we had a, a dramatic increase in the number of diagnostics being used, 30 more schools are utilizing these tools. This is another 30% increase. So the question is, are there results yet? I'm gonna give you a couple of quick snapshots from grade three, since we just recently talked about evidence of learning transition data with grade three. As of May, over 17,000 diagnostics have been completed by third graders across the district. At Drew Elementary School, for example, there have been 23 occurrences of direct support from the elementary math team. And they have increased their diagnostics administered from 47 to 139 this year. They have had special ed growth in their district assessment proficiency from 10% of third graders to 40% of third graders with the increase in the use of the pre-module diagnostics. Um, Whetstone Elementary. They've increased their diagnostics administered from 92 to 382. Their, el their emerging multilingual growth in district assessment proficiency has gone from 8% of third graders being proficient to 65% of third graders being proficient. So the more we're able to help teachers and the more teachers are able to use these tools, um, the, better, the better able they are to understand who their students are and differentiate the needs accordingly. When teachers truly understand where their students are and what they know and what they don't yet know, they're able to provide the appropriate level of challenge that will foster growth. Ultimately, all students will be working towards grade level standard, and they might not get there the same way. It should be strategically differentiated. That's what you should be seeing in the classroom. So that second focus, where know the math is knowing what students have to know and how to do it. Knowing the students is knowing the who. Who are you serving? and what are their needs. Dr. Logan. Thank you. So if we go to the next slide, please. Just as a, a summary, um, what are our immediate next steps? So right now, uh, schools are in the process of drafting their, their math plans for the school improvement um, plan. As we mentioned, they're receiving learning on that today. Our job is to work with our colleagues in central services to um, provide coaching and support on those plans as they are in development and those goals. And we'll be working on that um, now through, throughout the summer and into the fall, really. Um, and the school improvement plan is an ongoing, it's a living uh, document. And so we, that's a part of how we coach and work with schools throughout the school year. But that's an immediate next step that's happening now. Of course, we're gonna continue to provide professional learning and coaching to our schools. Um, throughout the summer is a very busy time for professional learning. So we're planning and looking forward to that right now. Um, in addition, as, as Ms. Berlinger talked about, um, math coaches is something that we uh, really do believe with that. Um, extra additional resource and support, we can reach more schools faster uh, with that targeted coaching, the curriculum study. And so we're, we're planning on moving forward um, with hopefully being able to hire some math coaches to be able to support our schools. 
And finally, for accountability, um, we're, we will conduct quarterly classroom visits. We have just wrapped up visiting all 40 middle schools as a data um, point. We're going to be providing some information to the board about what our findings were, but it has been really amazing to be in all of those spaces, to see instruction happening, and, and we've learned a great deal um, that is going to, that is helping us to shape our professional learning and engagement with leaders and even our future work going into how we approach coaching and support for our middle school teachers um, into the next school year. Um, with that, I will turn it over to the committee for further discussion. Next slide, please. Thank you. Well, thank you. This has been a lot of information, and I know we're running out of time. We've got about 15 minutes left. I just have a couple of um, questions. One, you talk about expanding district-wide communications about the math plan. What, what does that mean? What does that look like? So we have a lot of ideas and we'd be you know, willing to, we're open to all ideas, but we really need to, aside from getting out there and engaging with people, right, having discussions and sharing the plan like we've done today, we want to ensure that our website is, is very active and accurately um, provides resources where parents, community uh, members and caregivers and students can go on and really understand what the plan is, can be use the information that's there to be able to assess where their child is and what their child might need. And so there's work to provide some updates, um, working with the communications team so that what we provide is clear and helpful to our community. So that's one big uh, upgrade that we're working on, um, as well as, as we said before, just engaging with different folks who aren't the typical people that we get to hear from. I, I think I probably didn't ask the question I really wanted to answer, too. I think what I want to know is, I, I don't think parents understand that there is a paradigm shift. How is that being communicated? That's a part of our plan. So that's a part of our messaging. And, and I think the answer I just gave still applies, because it, it's about making sure that we communicate it, making sure it's clear. And that happens in different ways. Not only what's what's printed and what's online, what our schools communicate. So coaching with them to ensure that they have the messaging because they reach their communities in a different way. And then as we uh, share this and meet with different groups, being very clear about the shift that's happening and how we're supporting it. I want to be sure to hold time for my fellow board members, but I just have to ask this. I consider myself highly educated. I had no idea that this was actually, that the shift was occurring. I mean, I knew we had talked about it, but I didn't understand that. So I just want to suggest to you that this is going to have to be plain speaking English to people for, for them to understand. Um, I have one question for Dr. Addison, and it really concerns the diagnostic test. I, I heard you talk about Drew and Whetstone, but I, I'd like to get a snapshot of the schools that are using it and making good use of it and, and some feedback, some, some numbers about how it's looking. And what I'm trying to figure out is are all of our schools that need to be using it using it? Because are these the schools where the kids really are not doing as well? And are, are the schools that are using it the schools that you normally would expect that the children are doing better anyway? Sure, we can work with the um, elementary math team to obtain the information on the schools and provide some follow-up data in terms of performance around that. I, I would appreciate that. My, uh, one last thought, and I'm, I know I promise somebody else can say something. You know what you're going to get? That you're dummying down the curriculum. So somewhere in your FAQs is going to have to be some discussion that you aren't dummying down the curriculum. I don't know how you explain that to people. I mean, it makes sense to me. I, you know, I didn't take algebra until, what, ninth grade? I think it was ninth grade when I took it. And I was fine. So I think you're going to have to convince the people who who believe that we should still do Algebra one in the eighth grade, that the research has moved beyond that. that that's all I wanted to say. I'm going to start with Ms. Harris. Thank you. Um, well, I just want to say first, this is the kind of thing that really gets me energized and excited. Um, you know, you know, it's outside the box thinking, but it's also just a lot of common sense. 
Make sure your teachers are excellent. Make sure they know the math, they can do the math, and they know their students. Um, that seems like a pretty straightforward recipe. Um, and I'll just ask, you know, two questions because I think this is some of the uh, chatter around these two things I think has been going on in the system for a long time. And one is, so, you know, we know that it, you know, teacher excellence is essential for students to really master content, have a good experience in their classroom and, and do as well as they can. But how are we looking at our, our the size of our classes? How many, you know, faces are engaging with a single instructor and how that relates to their ability to really ensure that students are, are um, receiving the instruction in a way that's working for them. But I think one of the things you mentioned was doing these pre-modular diagnostics has got to help with that. But so how are we dealing, you know, and what are we seeing as sort of, um, I don't want to use the word ideal, but but a good class sizes for this level of instruction and content mastery. Yeah. yeah. So, th so the smaller, the better. Um, and I'll just speak from what I've been seeing as I've been in, in the middle schools a lot over the past couple of months um, at the middle schools that we visited. One of the things that we've noticed is that, is that those classes are running pretty small. Um, and so principals, our school leaders, recognize the importance of having smaller class sizes, particularly in the math classroom, and they work within the realms of their staffing to be able to, to do that as much as possible. Um, I think that's something that our school leaders are very attuned to, and, and we're seeing it at least in the classrooms that I've seen recently. Sure. At the elementary level, the, the current staffing model is actually a challenge. Um, as we are surfacing fewer students who are truly in need of those accelerated math courses, the, the model of saying I have um, 40 fifth graders or 40 fourth graders so I'm going to give you two fourth grade teachers or 48 fourth graders and I'm going to give you two fourth grade teachers but only eight of them or nine of them need accelerated math, leaves 40 left over for the on grade level course. And so we're running into, we're working to think outside the box. We've been leveraging the virtual academy, for example, for schools that have very small numbers for the accelerated courses. But that traditional staffing model of just dividing the total number of children by a, to get an even ratio doesn't work when you're trying to program for students where they are in their learning. What you don't want is your majority of your students who will be ready for enriched on grade level content having the biggest classes because you still have to staff something else that's too small. So it's a question we're asking and I don't have the answer for it, but it's coming up more and more as we are moving in this direction with this shift in thinking. Just, you know, keeping that front and center and, and, and never Pretending that it's not an issue is probably the, one of the best things that we can do at this point and keeping focused on that. And the other question I have just gets to um, longstanding debates about, you know, mixed ability and, and homologous ability grouping, especially for math. And um, the old messaging that you could put all these mixed abilities in a single class with a single teacher and that teacher could adapt the content to the needs of all the different levels. And I think, you know, a lot of people think that that's really, really difficult and that it sort of ensures that all the different levels of students are not quite getting what they need. So what are we doing when it comes to mixed ability or how does this approach help serve mixed ability classes? So the, the best strategy for that is a research-based strategy called cluster grouping. And um, there is a, a, a local consultant that I know our Office for Accelerated and Enriched Instruction historically has partnered with um, in, order to, in order to better understand and then ultimately to train our leaders and our teachers how to apply cluster grouping in order to build classes. What that does is it provides a heterogeneous class but limits the range of the capacity of the students in the particular in the particular room so that a teacher doesn't have all of the different levels of need all in one classroom because you're right you get to a point where you have too many different kinds of needs and you can't meet 
any of them, right? So you're targeting right to the middle. But one of the strategies that we want to bring back to MCPS and really dig into is this idea of cluster grouping. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think I'm, that's, I think, what I saw in my elementary school experience a while ago, mm -hmm. um, which seemed um, a reasonable one. But thank you very much for all of this. Mr. Kim, no, no questions. Well, I want to thank you. I want to thank all of the staff that came today because this is a very timely topic, and it's very important that our parents and our public understand what's going on, um, because it's not an easy thing when you're trying to shift from one way of practice to another. So we will, of course, be looking for the plan of action. Just one final question. When you said each school is developing a math plan, they're developing it based on the demographics and statistics at their school, so it's not a, it's not a, a one size fit all, fits all coming from us? Correct, yes, okay. that's a part of the school improvement goals that they Okay, mm -hmm. Okay, that, I think that's very important. Um, I think it's also very important, like I said, that the parents be involved in this because, I mean, Eureka math is great. I, I can't even understand it half the time. But <laughs> So the parents need to understand what's going on. Thank you, and I think now we are adjourned. Thank you.